What's up, traders? Anthony Cordelli here, and thank you for tuning in to the Futures Radio Show podcast. Today's panel discussion is on Russell U.S. reconstitution rebalancing in 2023. What traders and investors need to know. My guests are Catherine Yoshimoto, Director of Product Management at FTSE Russell. Andrani D, Head of Global Investment Research at FTSE Russell. Paul Woolman, Executive Director, Global Head of Equity Indexes at CME Group. Rick Rosenthal, Director, North American Derivative Sales, CBOE Global Markets. Today's podcast is sponsored by FTSE Russell, the home of the Russell 2000 Index. Did you know that with an 81% share and $1.6 trillion in institutional assets benchmark, the Russell 2000 is the top choice by far among institutional investors? Like all Russell U.S. indexes, it is rules-based, transparent, and reliable, regularly updated with the latest IPOs and annually rebalanced. For more information, go to footsierussell.com. For today's podcast, I'm going to bring in each guest from all of the major exchanges, one at a time to discuss the Russell Recon and all that you as traders need to know about it. First off, I will bring in Catherine Yoshimoto. Great to have you here. It's becoming a annual thing as you and I speak, and we always talk about the Russell Recon. And it's really very important to have this discussion every year because the Russell does have an annual rebalance different from the NASDAQ, the Dow, the S&P. Talk to us a little bit about that and what we're going to learn from you in your slides today. Yeah, absolutely. I'll be covering the uh, a high level overview of the Russell Index's construction, why institutional investors have followed the Russell indexes and, you know, why clients and the market participants who track the indices like the Russell indexes and this year's recon schedule so you're informed about what's coming up uh, on June 23rd. Sounds great. And I think maybe we just jump right into it and get into the slides because we've got a large panel today and everybody, just so you know, throughout today's discussion, you're going to be seeing some of these slides on here. And I want you to know that they're all going to be available for you to download at anthonycredelli.com and for everyone to follow all these people on Twitter and to learn more about what the exchanges are doing. There will be all of those links will be in the description, whether you're watching on YouTube or listening later in iTunes. So Catherine, uh, let's pull up those slides and get started. So most people who listen to the show are probably already familiar with the small cap Russell 2000 and large cap Russell 1000 indexes, which were launched in 1984 as modular components that added up to the broad cap Russell 3000 index and the growth and value indexes, which were launched in 1987. Since their launch, adoption of the Russell indexes has grown, especially among institutional investors with $12 trillion in assets benchmarked as of the end of 2021 to the entire Russell indexes franchise. What resonated with institutional investors with the index design was the Russell Index's objective, comprehensive, and modular construction, which was maintained thoroughly through scheduled reconstitutions. $12 trillion tracking the Russell Indexes, and this includes both active and passive assets. About 70% of those benchmarked assets, or $8.5 trillion, is benchmarked to a Russell Growth or Value Style Index. The assets tracking contribute into making Russell Recon Day one of the busiest trading days in the U.S. equity markets, culminating in $140 billion traded at the close of last year's reconstitution, which is also why FTSE Russell makes sure there is clear communication to the market as to what is changing and when, so that the annual reconstitution continues to be an orderly rebalance event, largely viewed by the market as a liquidity event. Russell indexes are maintained daily for corporate actions, quarterly share and flow updates and IPO additions in an effort to mitigate the turnover impact at the annual reconstitution. The institution is a critical part of maintaining the representativeness of the Russell indexes as markets change and so do the companies that should be defined as small cap, large cap growth or value. The annual reconstitution resets the membership in the Russell indexes so that the indexes continue to accurately reflect the market segments that they were designed to represent. All right, Catherine, I want to talk a little bit about this, the what and the why. I mean, this is one of those things that really does in my opinion, separate the Russell from these other indexes. Dive in a little bit more, and so the traders and the investors understand the what and the why this is actually happening within the Russell. Sure, so the complete rebalancing of the Russell US indexes takes place once a year in June. 
large cap, mid cap, small cap, micro cap, the size segments are reset. The break points are reset at this event based on a rank date. This year was April 28th. So the, the break points between the size indexes are reset and the index membership is updated based on where they should fall this year, based on that rank date. So the markets have obviously moved year to year and this year is no different. You know, there's been volatility in the market. So you're going to see some small cap companies actually rise into the Russell 1000, the large cap company. They've become big enough to exceed the breakpoint and band. There is a banding implemented in order to reduce turnover at the reconstitution. But you'll see some of those small cap names shifting into the large cap index and vice versa. Some large cap names have fallen in market cap total market cap. So, you know, they will be moving into the Russell 2000 index, for example. The same with the growth in value indexes. They're also re reset in terms of the calculation done to determine growth in value style membership. So this is as of the same rank date, April 28th. So stocks will move between growth and value. And this year you'll see some big companies, tech giants moving back into growth. For example, Meta was a big name talked about last year. They moved into partial value last year and they'll be moving back into fully growth. So changes like that will be occurring. And this is because markets change clearly as the numbers show. And also in addition, float is updated in terms of the available shares to the market. So float was a Russell index's innovation back in 1984 at the index launch, because Russell believed that the share classes included in the index should actually be available for any investor to buy and freely available in the market. So this is a critical part of rebalancing the indexes annually and, and float adjustment actually has become industry standard today. The closely watched breakpoint between the large cap and small cap indexes reflects the changes over the years in the markets. As I mentioned, they change year to year. This year, it declined to 4.2 billion, again, reflecting the volatility in the markets compared to last year's 4.6 billion. I've included a few slides here covering an overview of the construction methodology of the Russell indexes implemented at annual reconstitution, again, based on information of that rank date on April 28th this year. However, it's always best to refer to the complete ground rules on FTSERussell.com. This slide gives you a visual of the rank and banding process in constructing the Russell indexes. There's also a helpful infographic that walks you through the process on FTSERussell.com. And a closer look at how we start from the universe of approximately 7,000 securities down to the 3,000 that make up the Russell 1000 and Russell 2000 indexes. Now at the launch, the Russell indexes consisted of the 3,000 split into the 1,000 and 2,000. Today, we include also micro cap stocks beyond the 3,000, up to 4,000 eligible securities that, can, uh, that make up the Russell 3,000 extended or E index. So you can see the bands that are applied between the size segments in order to mitigate turnover between the 1,000, uh, the largest 1,000 stocks making up the Russell 1,000 and the next 2,000 stocks that make up the Russell 2,000. So you can see here about the middle of the slide, how the 1,000 and 2,000, you know, the break point is at the 1,000 stock. There's a hard break at 3,000. There is no banding at the bottom of the Russell 2,000, but there is a band at this 1,000 stock. It's based on cumulative market cap percentiles. So based on the, the stocks ranking, uh, by market cap and the percentile that's calculated based on that rank, uh, two and a half percent above and below that break point. Now it's not two and a half percent plus or minus on that break point, 4.2 billion that for this year. I just want to clarify that point because some people get confused about that. It's actually based on the percentile ranking of the stocks. The band, it, the actual like band is actually above two and a half percent in terms of just if you take that number and calculate plus or minus, that's not going to get you the band. But but the bands are published on FTSERussell.com, so you can definitely find more information on that there. On this slide, you can see a snapshot of how each of the major size segments looked as of this year's rank date of April 28th, uh, the break points here. And then again, so the bands are for the Russell 1000, 2000 are published. So for example, at the top of the Russell 2000 band, the market cap that the company had to have on rank day in order to move into the Russell 1000. And at the bottom of the Russell 1000 band, the market cap it had to drop below in order to join the Russell 2000 from the Russell 1000. Now the band is applicable to just existing members. And this is again, to mitigate turnover at reconstitution. 
what I find so interesting about the Russell index is, is that you actually are earning your way into each one of these indexes. There's a standards that go behind each one of this. And so they're all weighted also accordingly as well. Correct. Correct. So float adjustment comes into play. So once the rank is done based on total market cap, so all the shares are included in the company size determination, but the weight in the index is float adjusted. And in earlier, I showed a, a slide that covered like a high level summary of the index rules, uh, you know, critical um, point to highlight is the minimum 5% float. However, in 2017, with some hype around companies uh, launching shares that don't have voting rights, FTSE Russell also introduced a voting rights rule, minimum 5% company voting rights. And, and so this will actually come into play. Some stocks will be deleted because uh, the existing members were given five years to meet the minimum 5% voting rights uh, rule. And if they haven't met that rule, then they will be deleted from this year's reconstitution from the Russell indexes. This is a point that clients have come to us and pointed out, apparently S&P did away with their, what's sometimes called dual share class rules, where shareholders are not given voting rights and our clients have criticized our competitors for not implementing this. We do believe that this is an important part of making sure that the indexes are investable, that shares included are freely available to the market. So switching gears, FTSE Russell uses book to price as its value variable and two growth variables to calculate the Russell style indexes. Now, this is important to also highlight that our competitors use different variables. So sometimes they're confused as to why a certain stock is determined to be growth by us, but value by a competitor. It's because it depends on the variable you're using to variables you're using to construct the style indexes. Russell Research found these three variables to be highly representative and with banding on the composite value score strikes the best balance between representation and turnover. Small cap style is calculated separately from large cap style so as not to distort the growth and value indexes due to characteristic differences stemming from size. The, style, the Russell style indexes assign approximately 70% of the Russell 1000 or Russell 2000's float adjusted market cap to either growth or value. However, there's about 30% of market value in the middle representing companies that exhibit both growth and value characteristics. So for companies that fall within this range, their index shares are split proportionally according to their style probabilities to growth or value. So the Russell 1000 growth plus the Russell 1000 value indexes will always equal the Russell 1000. So that's what happened last year with Meta. Some of their shares became, were assigned to the value index. So they were actually included in both the Russell 1000 growth and value indexes, but their shares total will add up to the shares that are including the Russell 1000. Now this year, again, Meta will be changing styles. So they will be hundred percent growth from this year's reconstitution. Quick question. How often do you see that happen with a stock like that? Generally, the style indexes are stable. It's, it's again, based on the variables, the underlying data that comes in, uh, the book to price for the value side and the two growth variables representing the growth side. So it, generally, it's stable. Again, it, because of the composite value score, that was um, the banding was implemented in order to reduce the turnover. Now, the style indexes will have higher turnover than the size indexes. So the Russell 1000 uh, likely mo lowest turnover. Then the small cap will have more turnover because they're smaller stocks, and th there's generally a little bit more turnover there. But then you'll also then see more turnover in growth and value just because of the shifts building on the Russell 1000, 2000 shifts plus the growth and value. Um, but the banding or CBS banding uh, it was found to help mitigate that turnover back in 2011 when the new current methodology was implemented. So Russell indexes do not assign sector targets in their construction. So the resulting industries reflect the U.S. market at the time of reconstitution. You can see energy led in terms of performance over the one-year period. However, year-to-date, large-cap tech companies have made a comeback. This is one of the most important things I think that traders and investors need to know about the Russell is that it's what I also think is different versus the NASDAQ or the S&P is that you look at the NASDAQ and just this year alone, it's really led by a handful of stocks. But when you look at the Russell, it's more balanced throughout and it's led by sectors. 
an individual name is not going to have as much of an impact on the Russell. It's going to be more of a sector that has an impact versus an individual stock. Am I right on that, Catherine? speaking the russell 1000 is more diversified than say the nasdaq 100 right or the russell 2000 is more even more diversified because there are more names so the largest stocks if you look at the top 10 it's not going to be as higher weight as like the top 10 in the russell 1000 yeah definitely russell 2000 the small cap stocks aren't necessarily going to be driven so much by individual stocks kind of the represent representation of the small cap segment in terms of this year's key dates, rank date was April 28th. We announced preliminary additions and deletions to the market on May 19th. And any updates will continue to be posted to footsierussell.com on the following Fridays, leading up to the reconstitution day of June 23rd. Next up, we have Andrani D, Head of Global Investment Research at FTSE Russell. Andrani, first time on the show. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Anthony, for having me. Glad to be here. Great to have you. Before we get to the slides today, can you tell everybody a little bit about what you do at FTSE Russell and some of the things that we will be discussing with your slides today? Sure. So I head the global investment research team. We are the client-facing research team within FTSE Russell. And what we do is provide market insights to our clients across asset classes, across the different geographic parts of the world, both on a deep dive asset class level and also on a multi-asset cross-asset basis. So my part in today's discussion is, as Catherine talked about, the Russell Index Reconstitution is a quantitative rules-driven process that's picking up the underlying changes in the economy and the market. So I'm going to look back on the last 12 months. What are those changes that have happened? And I'm, I'm going to close with a slide which will look at the long-term changes in the U.S. economy and how much of it Russell is the index reconstitution process is picking up over time. All right, Indrani, what are we looking at here? All right. So this slide, what we are looking at, and whenever I say last 12 months year to date, all my data is through May 31st. So it's important to point out the black line is the Russell 1000. The blue line is the all world X United States. Everything is in US dollar. So the couple of things that I want to point out here is broadly over the entire last two months, equity markets are now basically flat. And over this entire 12 month, last 12 month, the US is marginally ahead of the rest of the world. But the interesting point is year to date, US is strongly ahead. The point being, as we go through our slides, while things may seem flat on the surface, so many changes have happened below the surface at different time points and different parts of the equity markets. And that is what makes this whole discussion so interesting. So let's go on to the next slide. Now here, the black line is large versus small caps, again over the last 12 months. And the other two lines are the style factor, growth versus value in the large space and the small space. And on the right-hand side, you have the bar charts on how markets have really done. Now, three important takeaways from this slide. If you look at the last 12 month and year to date, it seems to be a consistent trend that, all right, large caps outperform the small caps and growth outperform value. But look at how things change over the course of the last 12 months, meaning look at the black line and how sharply it goes up in March. Now, March is when the banking crisis happened. And right at that point, markets became very conscious of the fact that resilience in balance sheets, business model, cash flows, critically important. And so the large caps really started outperforming the small caps. And remember, over the entire 12 months, growth has outperformed. But for large parts of the second half of last year, it seemed value was outperforming and value might make a consistent comeback. But no, earlier this year, the story changed and growth has really made a comeback. Now, let's go on to the next slide because... Let's look at what's driving this growth versus value. And again, in the last 12 months, you will see, and I'm, when I say industry, the ICB classification, the 11 parts of the market at the highest level. Look at the green line. That's technology. Over the last 12 months, technology has had a huge run-up outperforming other industries. 
but it's really a time story. It really happened in May where the sharp run up in technology made it the clear winner in the last 12 months. And the gray line at the bottom, that's real estate, deeply in the red. Now, the next slide, let's look at what are the macro drivers that have been happening in the economy, which has driven this industry performance. On the left-hand side, we see the oil price movement in that blue line. And as we are rolling off the sharp pickup in oil prices after the Ukraine conflict, in the last 12 months, oil prices are down. Energy has still been an out, it's outperforming relative to the underlying oil price because Percentage change-wise, oil has come down, but oil prices still remain high on a level basis. That's that's why the energy stocks have been doing better than the oil price movement might reflect. Now, a very interesting story on the right-hand side, where you see what happens in rates and what happens in the technology industry. It's an almost inverse correlation of each other. Last year, rates went up sharply. Tech did not do so well. When rates stabilized or came down, tech really took up. And what happens in the other industry that's very exposed to rates? Real estate. It used to have a consistent negative correlation with rates. So when rates went up last year, real estate underperformed. However, while rates stabilized, real estate has not yet come back simply because it's facing more structural headwinds. The work from home technology and utilization of commercial real estate and also as we will talk in a few seconds about the small bank the banking crisis which has really impacted a key source of finance for the real estate industry now let's go on to the next slide because we talked a lot about the banking crisis and how the techs have outperformed and i really want to highlight this ultimate difference in why large caps are doing so much better than small cap, it really boils down to two industries, the tech outperformance, particularly the mega cap tech outperformance, and the banking underperformance, which is particularly concentrated in the small cap Russell 2000 space. Now, as we will see in the next slide, this one is pointing out in April and May separately, and you'll see the difference. If you see the sector weighted return contributions on the left hand side in April, you will see that in the Russell 2000 small caps, the bank underperformance really detracted. Same thing happened in May. It's the banks that really detracted from the Russell 2000 performance. And in the next slide, what I want to again highlight is month by month, when the banking crisis initially hit in March, both large and small banks went down strong underperformance in negative territory. But then the markets digested the news and they figured out that the large cap banks are very strong and resilient. So both in April and May, the large banks, Russell 1000 banks had positive performance, whereas it's these Russell 2000 small banks that kept on having negative underperformance. So that's a very important trend in markets in the last, uh, last 12 months. One cannot talk about the equity markets without having a sense on where earnings and valuations are. So I want to highlight, you know, obviously after a long period of earnings estimates going down, earnings revisions have now actually recently jumped up. So are we turning the cycle on the corner on the economic cycle? We have to see. But similarly, forward PEs have also recently drifted up, especially for the Russell 2000. Now, this is a slide. Till now, we were talking about all the changes that have happened in the markets in the last 12 months. And this slide really ties in going back in time since 1985 through the current reconstitution. How has it been picking up the underlying trends in the U.S. economy? So, you know, the two lines that you see, the black line is the GDP growth of U.S. GDP growth year over year at the point of the Russell reconstitution. And the blue line is the changes in the Russell breakpoint. Companies moving between the Russell 1000 and 2000. Are those trends correlated? Because logically they should. And the two lines on the, uh, excuse me, the two graphs, left hand side is since 1985, right hand side is since 2000. You see these two lines are really tracking each other very closely. If somebody is deeply into math, then the table on the top right shows the correlation between this U.S. economic growth 
and the size break points between Russell 1000 and 2000. And you'll see the same thing. Since 1985, the correlation is north of 50%, strong. Since 2000, it picks up even more to the high 60s. Since the financial crisis, this correlation has picked up to about mid 70s. My point being when Catherine spoke about the changes in reconstitution methodology over time, the numbers would indicate that those changes are making the Russell reconstitution uh, pick up the underlying US trends strongly, more strongly over time. Yeah, hence why everyone talks about the Russell being the best representation of the US economy. As a rules-based index, it's meant to pick up the changes in the economy, and these numbers would indicate that it is doing so. Next up, we have Paul Woolman, Executive Director, Global Head of Equity Index Products at CME Group. Paul, welcome to the show. First time on. Thanks very much, Ashley. Glad to be here. Great to have you here. Now, Paul, we've heard from Catherine. We've heard from Indrani. They gave us a great insight as to how the Russell recon works, why it happens, what it is. And Johnny gave great detail on what's happening within the indexes. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about what's happening uh, from the CME group side a little bit here, right? The products that uh, the, the futures, the RTY and the micros and even the event contracts that everyone can trade. Tell everybody a little bit about yourself, what you do at CME group and about what CME sees on the Russell recon side. Sure, thanks. So my own role is I'm heading up uh, the global equity product team at uh, CME. Uh, so designing new futures and options, bringing them to market, trying to make them work better in the in the marketplace. And in terms of the Russell Recon, it's a very exciting uh, trading event during the uh, year. Uh, it's on everyone's calendar. It affects so much of the ecosystem. But when we think about uh, from a derivatives perspective, there are ways in which the uh, derivatives can be useful to, for helping clients to manage their risk over that Russell reconstitution period, whether it be the Russell 2000, Russell 1000, you can use index based products such as futures to help manage your risk and uh, really outsource some of the heavy lifting of really trying to rebalance the, um, the, uh, the exposure that you have. Yeah, no doubt. And every year I always see around this time you have rollover and you have Russell recon really right around the same time. And I'm always seeing a big surge in volume and the Russell always becomes the, one of the, the trending topics on social media. And I know that there's so many new people, the futures, I'm excited to share with them some of the things that you're seeing on the CME group side. What are we going to be looking at when we get into your slides today? So this slide is really going to cover um, what I call the how to trade decisions. So when we think about how to get access to Russell indices, such as the 2000 or the 1000, there are a few different option, ways you can do that. So uh, they all have pros and cons. So we're going to cover some of those. Uh, also think about some of the evolution we've seen at CME in terms of the derivative space around the Russell complex, and then focus on the recon itself in terms of how you can use derivatives to help you manage your positions both before and in the run up to the recon and over the reconstitution itself. OK, so this slide's really trying to capture some of that how to trade decision. So when we think about trying to get exposure to an index such as Russell 2000 or Russell 1000, there are several ways you can do it. So one is by managing cash baskets, but there are also alternatives, index based products such as futures, the E-mini Russell 2000 or E-mini Russell 1000 future, for example. You can get it through ETFs. You can get exposure through uh, OTC, such as swaps or forwards. And for more sophisticated users, you can use options. And all of these products have various advantages and disadvantages depending on the actual client involved. There's no one size fits all answer to which one is best. But here on this table, you can see some of the differences outlined. If we think about index futures, really there's a few key points. So one, they're not fully funded instruments. So you don't have to deploy all your capital up front in order to get exposure if you use an index future. So from that perspective, they're highly capital efficient. They're also very liquid and transparent. So you can see the liquidity on the screen uh, and that they're able to, be, to see the price and interact with that order book. And that's very important, unlike some OTC products, which are a bit more opaque. The other thing is when you think about positioning, clients can go short or long with the future very easily. You don't have to get a borrow in place and you can trade it from the short side very easily. 
Uh, another thing which is a very important advantage for a lot of clients who use futures is the ability to trade outside cash hours. So you're not just restricted to the regular trading cash hours like you might be with some securities. Here you can trade around the clock and for a global index and a global event such as Russell Recon, that's very important. Now, on some things that you should keep in mind if you're using a product such as a future is that it's not a perpetual product. What I mean by that is it does have a finite maturity date and you're required to roll it to maintain your exposure. So as you come into that expiry period, which you were mentioning, Anthony, you need to actually think about that and roll to the next maturity contract. Some futures aren't block eligible, but the good news for Russell products at CME is they are. So in terms of the Russell 2000 futures, the e-mini versions, they're block eligible, and we see clients taking advantage of that and blocking the product as well as trading it on the order book. The final thing I'd mention is you can't trade futures in a regular securities account. You need to have a futures account set up. So that's just something to bear in mind if you try and use a futures product. Thanks for sharing the advantages and the disadvantages. Extremely important to know what product is best for you as a trader or an investor. And two things always come to mind when I think of futures. Obviously, the capital efficiencies is so extremely important. And it coincides with the shorting side of it as well, how easy it is to short it. And some people may say, why would I want to short an index? It's not necessarily that you would want to short the Russell itself, but you might be hedging against a portfolio that you are owning the ETF or something like that. And for a short period of time or for any period of time, you might want to hedge that risk. And I think that so many people, Paul, forget that's originally why futures were started, really a place to go and hedge risk. And you don't have to put up a ton of capital to short a Russell versus the portfolio size that you have. And so I think that's always extremely important for people to understand. So thank you so much for sharing that. So in terms of the Russell complex at CME, we got the Russell 2000 complex back in July 2017. That was both on the futures and options side. And since then, we've seen the product grow from strength to strength. But it's not all only been about the Russell 2000, thinking about the rest of the complex. So we've launched other products such as total return futures, and now something called adjusted interest rate total return future, which has become an, a, an interesting product. It's a swap replacement product, and that's been uh, started to be used more and more in the marketplace. Another advent that we launched was the micro e-mini version of Russell 2000. So this is a smaller size contract. It's one tenth the size of the e-mini uh, future. And it's very popular with the more active retail client, as well as with institutions who want to more fine tune their positions. Um, and that's been very successful, very liquid and added to the overall liquidity pool available through Russell 2000 futures at CME. Something else which we launched last year was dividend futures on the Russell 2000, and they've started to be traded more actively this year, open interest grown to over 20,000, and this is a really complementary product to the ecosystem, which I think is going to grow further and further in the future. And then finally, when it comes to options, we've seen this trend uh, across all options to have more short dated options and more uh, maturities and expiries available to clients. And that was uh, also seen with our Russell 2000 products where we launched uh, more daily expiries. So now we have expiries every day of the week, Monday through Friday, and that greater choice of precision and event risk can be managed by clients using Russell 2000 options. Boy, have we seen an increase in options activity on the future side with the zero DTE craze, Paul, right? I mean, it's it's really one of those things that uh, uh, everybody is really looking at these days, a, a lot of active traders. One thing before we get to the next slide, I just want to ask you a quick question. If you could please explain, a lot of people ask me this in emails. They say, what is a total return future? Sure. So um, it's a good question. So uh, the total return future is essentially with most futures, the underlying indices are what's called price return. And that means that the dividends are not included. So as the dividends drop out of the index, the index value falls. And that's not captured with inside the uh, future and it's part of the basis of the future. With a total return future, the dividends are included within either at the index level or within the product payoff somehow. And with our particular products, they're included in the payoff. Um, sorry, at the index level. So the total return indices uh, actually underlie these futures. And that's important because it allows clients to trade further down the maturity path. Given dividends are slightly uncertain to what they might be in one, two, three, four years time, uh, it, it means that clients tend to only trade the front month futures with their price return and roll them. With a total return future, it allows clients to trade uh, 
down the down the curve two years three years four years and clients want to do that they want to have core beta positions match up some of their structured products or other kind of exposure that they might have in their portfolio and historically they've done that on swap now what we see is with the advent of this listed product which is probably more capital efficient than some of those otc alternatives is that clients are starting to use these products much more and more so if we think about Russell 2000 futures and options, since they've come back to CME, as you can see in this chart, they've really gone from strength to strength. So when Russell 2000 first came back to CME back in 2017, the contract was trading around 100,000 contracts a day. Now, if we look by the dark blue line in this chart, we can see that the last few years has been trading over 200,000 contracts a day. So liquidity available has doubled. And that's been complemented by the light blue line here, which represents the amount of micro e-mini uh, Russell 2000 futures which are trading and that's just added a further liquidity pool which clients can use and they can either use the smaller contract or the larger contract but the combined liquidity pool has grown from strength to strength and if we compare that to say the competing ETFs which track this index the futures are far more liquid trading almost four times as much and indeed if you look at all of the notional that's traded in the underlying cash securities these futures trade as much as 60% the notional of all of those underlying securities trade all day. So that's really just highlighting the liquidity pool that's available here for clients to take advantage of. That was further reinforced by the fact that we actually had a record earlier this year in March of over 1.05 million contracts trade in the e-mini Russell 2000 future. Great to see the growth of futures and options. And so that is complemented by Russell 1000. Um, so we have futures on e-mini Russell 1000 and they've been growing similarly over the last few years. And what's interesting here is we reduce the block size to 15 lots on the Russell 1000, but also on the value and growth versions of this product. And as you can see, all three versions trade and clients have really taken advantage of the lower block size. And you can see that in the distribution between Globex, which is traded on the order book, BTIC, which is a functionality to trade against the close, which we're going to focus on a little bit more, and block percentages. The block percentages have gone up over the last couple of years. So now really coming to think about how can clients use the Russell 2000 futures and how can it help around the reconstitution itself? Here we see that Russell 2000 really is a really big operational burden for anybody trying to replicate the index. So I was a former index trader, and if you think about it, really you're trading all of the cons uh, constituents within the e -mini, within the Russell 2000 index, but also potentially the Russell 1000 index. So over 3000 names. And if you've got to trade all of those names, it's a high operational burden. You might make mistakes, or you might have some degree of imprecision. And if you get that, then that results typically in tracking error. And everybody who's a manager of uh, AUM and trying to track indices wants to avoid tracking error. So one easy way you can avoid tracking error is really to outsource the problem. And you can do that using a index-based product such as a future. So when it comes to the recon, what a lot of clients do is try and migrate their cash basket positions to an index-based product such as the E-mini Russell 2000 or E-mini Russell 1000 future. And they do that ahead of the reconstitution time. By doing so, they're holding a future over the recon. That means they're getting perfect tracking with the index over that period of time. And really it's up to someone else to manage that rebalance process and trade all the ads and deletes and all the upsizes in terms of, or downsizes in terms of trying to trade all the constituents in the right proportions. Now, two very important functionalities when you're trying to migrate to futures, one's called BTIC, which stands for Basis Trader Index Close, and another one's called an EFP. And if we first focus on BTIC, what it means is that you're agreeing intraday before the index close to a basis. And so in this example, Trader A trades against Trader B and agrees to a basis of 0 0.90 for 500 contracts. Once that basis on the BTIC has been agreed, that will be reported to the exchange. And then later in the day, once the actual official index level is known on the Russell 2000 in this case, the basis is added to that. So in this example, the official index close was 1,730 spot 20, and then plus 90 cents is added to that. And that results in the outright futures price of 1,731 spot 10. 
And then in this case, trader A will have bought 500 contracts at that price and trader B will have sold 500 contracts at that price. And that's what will result uh, be in their account at the end of the day. Now, another useful functionality is the EFP or exchange for physical. And in this example, we have an investor whose starting position is long the cash index, to the tune of $239 million of the Russell 2000 cash basket. And they're going to face a dealer such as a bank. And the dealer in this case is flat, has nothing on their balance sheet. In. They agree to an EFP and EFP is privately negotiated. And in this case, the basis that they agreed to was 70 cents positive. And they chose to apply that 70 cents to the previous day's index close on the Russell 2000, which was 1707 spot 20. And so that resulted in a futures equivalent price of 1707 spot nine. And what happens is that the investor basically divests their cash basket to the dealer, who now becomes long that $239 million of cash index stocks via the stock basket. And the investors basically divested that. Simultaneously, a future is exchanged between them. And so the broker, and in this case, the equivalent amount of contracts is 2,800 of the E-mini Russell 2000 future. The broker is now short 2,800 contracts whilst the client is long 2,800 contracts. And if we look at the final position, this means the investor has effectively replaced their cash basket with a futures position. Whilst on the dealer side, they're long the cash basket and short the future. But in terms of their market exposure, they're neutral because the two positions offset. So they have this difference in between their long and short position on their balance sheet, but in terms of actual exposure to the marketplace, they're flat. And so this is a very popular functionality and both this and BTIC, which we mentioned earlier, allow clients to move relatively seamlessly between cash baskets and futures and help manage their positioning over the reconstitution. Next up, we have Rick Rosenthal, Director, North American Derivative Sales at CBOE. Rick, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Anthony. It's a pleasure to be with you. It's great to have you back on the show. You and I have talked about Russell Recon many times in the past, and we touched a little bit on it with Paul and how much options have been growing. And you got to be pretty happy about that at CBOE. Yes. In fact, um, CBO has had a tremendous uh, run for the past three years. We've seen record volume uh, year over year since 2021. Um, a lot of that has come from retail participation. And as Paul pointed out earlier, uh, there's really a, a, an astounding amount of volume coming from uh, traders that want to trade uh, short term durations. So almost half the daily volume in our um, SPX is coming in the form of zero DTE, zero days till expiration. When people look at zero DTEs, the volume can't just be coming just from retail. Uh, and I know that there's a big story out there for that. But are you seeing a lot of institutional clients trading zero DTEs? We are seeing institutional participation. And I can't break it out in terms of what percentage is coming from retail versus what's coming from institutional. But I would say that the majority is coming from retail. Why is that? If you look at last year, the market was down considerably. Let's say the S&P was down 19%. But if you look at volatility as measured by VIX, the VIX index, the 30-day expected volatility, it was muted. And uh, that's because the sell-off was a slow burn. Intraday volatility is pretty robust. So last year, the intraday volatility on the Russell 2000 and the S&P 500 was close to 2%. So this is a great opportunity for those who want to trade volatility, whether to reap the rewards or harvest volatility by selling premium. Oftentimes they do that in the form of a spread or play intraday market direction. So this is a, a Russell focused presentation, so I won't go into the other products, but I will say that we are seeing growing interest in all of our index products trading these short dated options. Yeah, no, fantastic. And before we get to the slides, Tell everybody what we're going to be discussing today. Sure. So the Russell Recon is really an important event because once a year, the Russell family, which incorporates over 3,000 constituents, you have the Russell 3,000, which is the overall 
publicly held equities, then you have the um, subsets, the Russell 1000 large cap, the 2000 small cap, then you have the growth in value, et cetera. So it's no small undertaking for FTSE Russell to do this recalibration. And um, according to FTSE Russell, both institutional and retail investors have invested in funds or portfolios that track about $12 trillion in assets that are benchmarked to the Russell indexes. So on a short-term basis, these adjustments have the potential to create some imbalances and perhaps volatility. And finally, on the rebalance day, we're seeing a, an incredible amount of order flow coming into the market where we're seeing almost $140 billion worth of stocks being bought and sold at the market close on the rebalance day. So volatility is something that we monitor. Options are a great way to really express a view in volatility or the ability to harvest volatility. So the landscape of the US equity market is constantly changing. Last year, the number of IPOs dropped from 1,035 to 181. Inflation led to higher pricing. Uh, the Federal Reserve raised rates about seven times. These factors and several, many others require the FTSE Russell to recalibrate their indexes to maintain the accuracy of their benchmarks. Drilling down into the Russell 2000, in the early 90s, Nobel laureates Eugene Fama and Kenneth uh, French used their Fama French model to create a rationale for a small cap premium. Their study concluded that small cap stocks, although considered riskier in the long run, can outperform the large cap stocks as evident from 2000 to 2023. The constituents of the Russell 2000 tend to be relatively young and leveraged, carrying higher levels of debt. And during periods of US economic expansion, these companies are domestically centered and, and they tend to get most of their revenues from domestic activity. Additionally, you know, industry sectors, as pointed out by um, Catherine and Indrani, um, industry sectors have a significant impact on the weightings um, of the uh, constituents and, and the impact on the overall index. Uh, volatility levels are different between the 1,000, 2,000. Changing interest rates have an impact, uh, probably more pronounced in the Russell 2000 than the 1,000 because of the leverage in the small caps. And so we look at the difference in performance between the Russell 1000 and 2000. And as a result, uh, they're, they're distinguished. They're, they're uh, uh, important differentiators because if, if a, an investor is looking for um, position for outperformance during economic growth, um, the Russell 2000 has a tendency to um, outperform, particularly during U.S. Uh, domestic growth. And at SIBO, these cash settled index options on the 2000, it's the third most actively traded index option on our exchange. So we have um, listed on SIBO, we have cash settled index options. We have cash settled index options on the Russell 1000, the growth, the value. We also have it on the Russell 2000. And as mentioned, it's the third most actively traded index product on our floor. For many years, the trading floor was filled with traders, brokers, and clerks handling the execution of orders using an open outcry auction market. And the open outcry market worked very well, and it still does to this day. It allows market participants to find risk capital, liquidity, and see a display of price transparency. Over time, the advances in technology introduced greater efficiencies and lowered the costs. And today, most of that trading volume is handled electronically. Fortunately, SIBO is still supporting open outcry. And we, in fact, we moved our trading floor last year from our old floor over to the Board of Trade building. And we have a brand new floor that's supporting both open outcry and an electronic market. So we refer to that as a hybrid market, offering the best of both worlds on our index products. And again, this allows brokers who are acting as agents to source risk capital, whether it's on the floor or off the floor, access liquidity electronically or in an open outcry fashion. So you might be wondering why preserve open outcry? Well, the ability to handle large or complex orders may require multiple parties 
Brokers acting as agents can access 13 market makers on the floor, 13 market making firms on the floor that stand ready, willing, and able to provide risk capital, or they can source liquidity off floor. And uh, in a large and complex order, which may be multi-leg, four, four legs, five legs, six, 10 legs, whatever, Open Outcry serves an auction quite well because you can negotiate a complex order. So whether it's a simple $17,000 trade or a $170 million transaction, the hybrid market for the Russell 2000 index options function very well. I do want to point out last year, SIBO introduced a micro options on the Russell 2000. So if you look at the notional value of our standard contract, it's 100 times the index. So it's right now $186,000 notional value. The mini, which has gained in popularity, is 10 times the index or $18,600. So far this year, option volume on the Russell 2000 regular contract has averaged about 59,000 contracts a day. That's up 31% compared to last year. And on a notional basis, the average daily volume translates to about $11 billion, also up about 30% year over year. Thank you so much for explaining all this so far. I know we've got a little bit more to cover, but interesting that you guys are keeping the floor. I've seen it on TV and I've seen that there is a good amount of people in there trading options. And I'm really curious when you see the recon, do you start to get a bump in volume at this time of year? Uh, are people starting a little bit early? Is it happening kind of last minute? I'm curious on the option side, does it happen all at once? How does that work? when the volume comes in for Russell Recon. That's a good point, Anthony. And this is something that I'm going to highlight in the next couple of slides. If you look at uh, volume, volume has been robust, but if you look at volatility and the expectation that Russell Recon, because of the recalibration of these benchmarks, may cause imbalances. It may cause supply demand imbalances where, um, these are constituents that are going to be added or removed from the various benchmarks. There is positioning of portfolios anticipating the addition and subtraction. And this may cause some uh, increased volume in the constituents. But from an index standpoint, we look at um, volatility as measured by SIBO's Russell Volatility Index, RVX, which follows the same methodology as the VIX index. And we're looking at the volatility levels during the recon period. And the, over time, um, let's say over the last 15 years, during the Russell recon period, six week period, we're actually seeing a trend of muted volatility. And I attribute that to FTSE Russell, Russell's ability to orchestrate in a very timely fashion, the candidates that are going to be considered for addition or subtraction. And so from, from my observations, Russell Recon is an opportunity to harvest volatility because we're not seeing during this time period increased volatility as a result of the rebalancing. Very interesting. Very cool. So as noted earlier, small caps tend to be more volatile. They're smaller cap and less liquidity, but in, in just in general terms, small caps are more volatile than their large cap counterparts. And as I just mentioned, SIBO created a Russell 2000 volatility index, which is measuring a 30 day expected volatility on the Russell 2000, taking the implied volatility from the Russell 2000 standard options contract. The RVX index, which is the Russell Volatility Index, is used as a barometer for measuring bullish and bearish sentiment. And one thing that's worth noting is there's a tendency to see an inverse relationship between the volatility levels reflected from RVX and the pricing of the Russell 2000. As we can see in this chart, we see when volatility increases, the Russell 2000 goes down and vice versa. Just want to point out you know, the Russell Volatility Index over time has been averaging around 24. Now, what does that mean? Well, for just for argument's sake, if the Russell 2000 currently at 1866, that means that over the 30-day time period, the range 
in the Russell 2000 could be anywhere from, let's say, 1600 to 1950. Today, the Russell volatility index is at 20.31. So as I just said earlier, we're seeing a muted volatility. It's trading the VIX indexes substantially below its average. But during the periods of increased volatility, like we saw in the global financial crisis in March of 2020, when we had sharp sell-offs, this RVX index spiked and it's typically it spikes in a very rapid form. During GF GFC, it uh, spiked above 80. It closed at an all-time high of 87.62. Last year, even though volatility was up, it wasn't up as much. We had periods where volatility increased to 30, but rarely did it get above 30, even though the Russell 2000 was down substantially in 2022. And that's because the velocity of change was not as pronounced. So with approximately $12 trillion of investment products tracking the Russell 2000 indexes, and as I said before, on Russell Rebalance Day, all of these Russell tracking portfolios need to adjust their positions by sending buy and sell orders to be executed on the market close on the rebalance day. So the potential, Anthony, is there for a volatile event. But as we've seen over time, volatility has been muted from the beginning through the rebalance day during Russell Recon. And FTSE Russell has, again, allowed for the rebalancing with minimal market impact. And this is an opportunity for market participants to take advantage of the lower volatility by looking at several option writing strategies. Now, SIBO has created several strategy benchmark indexes. We have a buy right, we have a 30 delta buy right, we have a cash secured put right. And these are strategy benchmark indexes measuring a hypothetical position. So the buy right would be owning the Russell 2000, selling an at the money call and systematically selling that call every 30 days. Similarly, the 30 Delta would be selling an out of the money call. This would be a 30 Delta call, meaning that there's a 70% chance the market will not move up to that strike price until, uh, between, until expiration. The cash secured put right is a fully collateralized position owning T-bills and selling an at the money put in systematic systematically rolling that every 30 days. So what we've noticed over the last five years, those three selected option writing strategies actually outperformed the Russell 2000 75% of the time. And so the ability for a market participant to take advantage of this low volatility by entering into an option writing strategy um, and there's some advantages and disadvantages between, let's say, the uh, buy right and the 30 delta buy right and the put right. So they have different profitabilities depending on the market conditions. Uh, but the ability to collect a premium during this time period, 75% of the time offered an opportunity to, to collect premiums. And that can be used as an income strategy to generate passively generate an alternative source of income, or it can be used to buffer volatility in the event there was volatility in the underlying Russell 2000. Fantastic presentations, everybody, today. Really can't thank you enough for spending the time with me. I want to go around the horn here real quick for really just some final thoughts that you guys have. Taking all of this in as a trader or an investor sometimes can be overwhelming. What I want to do is I just want to close out with just the final comments from all of you. And maybe you guys want to comment on what some of the the things that the other presenters may have mentioned. Catherine, you talked about the what and why of Russell Recon really gave us a fantastic detailed description of what it is, how it works, and why it happens. Any final thoughts from you today? Yeah, thank you, Anthony. I, I really loved Indrani's additional information on how the reconstitution is aligned with the movements in the economy and then how Paul and Rick added their perspectives on what tools traders can use to harvest volatility around this time. And then Rick actually mentioned a point that I didn't mention about how more domestically focused the Russell 2000 revenues are. About 20% consistently are the non-U.S. revenues coming into the 
Russell 2000 companies versus about 40% for the Russell 1000, which makes sense if you think about the multinational large companies that are in the Russell 1000 versus the more domestically focused smaller cap companies in the Russell 2000. So these are really great tools. The Russell indexes offer a comprehensive picture of the markets. And it, that's why it's important that they're rebalanced annually to make sure they're continuing to represent the segments that they're designed to deliver. Yeah, spot on, Catherine. Thank you so much. Next up, Indrani, loved your presentation today. You took us beyond the charts. A lot of people just chart the index. They don't look at what's happening within the index. And I think that's a massive mistake that a lot of traders, investors make is they just look at maybe the chart of an index when they're looking to trade or invest in it, and they don't really understand what's happening inside it. Any th final thoughts or comments that you'd like to make? Yeah, absolutely. To, the, uh, to expand on the point that you made, it's never about the headline number. It's always about the details, what's really driving things and go one step backward. What are the macro drivers? Because ultimately those are the things that are gonna get captured in company movements, industry movements, index movements, style, size, everything. So follow the drivers and that really gives an indication of where things, why they are where they are and potentially uh, throws light on where things could be headed. And Rick and Paul gave excellent information how to utilize that information in trading strategies. No, you're exactly right, Indrani. I couldn't agree with you more. When you understand what's happening on the macro side of things, what's driving these index, it helps you become a better trader and investor. Now, Paul, great perspective today from the CME Group side, understanding the different options that you have. You have options. You have the different size futures that we talked about, different types of futures. And there's so many ways for people to come in and trade these Russell indexes. And thank you for sharing all the different ways that people can. Any final thoughts on what some of the other panel talked about today and maybe your final thoughts before we let you go? Sure. Thanks, Anthony. And, you know, it's a great summary by Catherine and Drani in terms of the importance of Russell Recon, just how big an event it is in the calendar year affecting so many stocks and, and the amount of trading that you highlighted, Anthony, that needs to be done. Um, in terms of takeaways for me is really think about how index products such as futures can help you in terms of managing those positions, try and migrate away some of that uh, heavy lifting from an operational perspective by moving to an index-based product such as a future. And you can do that through EFP and BTIC, as we mentioned, but also for some subset of traders, they'll actually want to trade the ads and delete prior to the, the actual reconstitution date. And having a beta or an index-based product to trade against can be very useful. So that's an additional value prop potentially of, of a future. So just something to think about for clients as they look ahead to do the Russell Recon. Thank you so much, Paul. And there is definitely no shortage of products for people to go in and find the exact product for them if they want to participate in price action or if they want to hedge portfolios, they want to look for better capital efficiencies. So many things to talk about how futures and options can help people access these Russell products. Rick, a lot of takeaways from what you said today. And the one thing when I think back at what you were just discussing was how seamless this transition goes, right? And how it actually volatility goes down. I, in my mind, as a trader, you think you're going to have this massive surge in volatility and you think because you're, you're reconstituting what's happening within an index and that it's going to cause this spark of volume where people are going to be maybe last minute. But the way that FTSE Russell does it and sets it up, it creates what I've seen in the charts over the years is and this is kind of tied into what you talked about with the RVX. The RVX is actually tends to go down during this time period and the Russell actually tends to go up. And for the last few years, I've noticed that people go and pull up their charts. The market actually does the lower RVX and the up in the market in which is, I think, surprising in the sense that you don't have that spike in volatility and you guys have the products out there. People can come in early and hedge and it's just done so well and curious any really final thoughts that you have about everything that was discussed today so i think the russell ecosystem is enormous okay if you look, just break it into the russell 2000 segment the ecosystem includes as mentioned earlier swaps etfs futures options etc looking at the just from the derivative standpoint, the futures 
the options on futures and cash settled on index options and options on ETFs. The average notional volume for this portion, the derivatives portion of the ecosystem is almost 50 billion a day. There's a lot of trading going on in the Russell 2000 complex. Some of it is related to market direction. Some of it is related to volatility. But what's important to note is there's information that's contained in these products. The options, for example, has realized volatility and implied volatility. Futures has basis. You get a sense for what is the sentiment in the marketplace, bullish or bearish, for a time period. And so options are fantastic because you can define the kind of risk and the kind of return that you want using different types of strategies. So if you're looking for a hedging strategy, there's a multitude of strategies that you can use like a collar, or you can even outsource to an ETF that has a buffer protect type strategy. So the takeaway that I, I would provide is information. There's some good information looking at volatility. And because of the growth in the ecosystem, liquidity has never been better. And the ability to define an outcome, whether it's generating income, enhancing risk adjusted returns, or expressing a market view, the products are robust, the volume is robust, the risk capital is, is robust, and uh, there's never been a better time whether you do it yourself or, or outsource to Im implement a strategy that works best for you. Yeah, it's so true, Rick. You talk about the scope and the size of how big the Russell indexes are when you have a recon, and it just goes to the great job that you, CME Group, and everybody has done it, with the amount of liquidity for all these different products. And that's just a, a testament of, of what you guys have done all as exchanges and market participants involved in this. So Catherine, Andrani, Paul, Rick, thank you all so very much. Remember everybody to learn more about what they're doing. You want to go to footsierussell.com. You want to go to sebo.com. You want to go to cmegroup.com. And all the social media links will be down below in the description. And all of their presentations today are going to be available for you to download at Anthony Crudelli. Dot com and just a special thanks to uh, FTSE Russell, CME Group, and SIBO for participating in this and really having you guys take a lot of time. I'll put these presentations together and educate traders and investors on these products. And I can't thank you enough for, for doing that with me today. Thank you for listening to Futures Radio Show. If you enjoyed the show, please leave a five star review on iTunes. Never miss an episode. Go to anthonycrudelli.com and get on our email list for show notifications and for free content that is exclusively for subscribers. Also on anthonycrudelli.com, you will find tons of videos and education on trading futures, options, and crypto. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Opinions expressed are solely my own and my guests, and they do not express the views or opinions of my sponsors. Future's radio show is produced by Crudelli Productions.